today's reading, there's nothing difficult to understand. It's so straightforward. Hardly no explanation is needed. But in order to, the difficulty is not in intellect, difficulty is in connecting, um, connecting in the heart, emotionally, with the emotion of God. That's quite difficult, quite challenging, so we need God's help. Okay, chapter 14, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the droughts. Judah mourns and her gates languish. They mourn for the land, and the cry of Jerusalem has gone up. Their nobles have sent their lads for water. They went to the cisterns and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. Because the ground is parched, for there was no rain in the land, the plowmen were ashamed. They covered their heads. Yes, the deer also gave birth in the field, but left because there was no grass, and the wild donkeys stood in the desolate heights. They sniffed at the wind like jackals. Their eyes failed because there was no grass. O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do it for your namesake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. O oh, the hope of Israel, his Savior in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land and like a traveler who, who turns aside to tarry for a night? Why should you be like a man astonished, like a mighty one who cannot save? Yet you, O oh Lord, are in our midst and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. Thus says the Lord to these people, Thus they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet, therefore the Lord does not accept them. He will remember their iniquity now and punish their sins. Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for these people for their good. For when they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, a prophet say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall, we, shall, shall you have famine, but I'll give you a short peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not send, and who say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine those prophets shall be consumed, and the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem, because of the famine and the sword, they will have no room to bury them. Them, nor their wives, their sons, nor their daughters. For I will pour out their wickedness on them. Therefore, you shall say this word to them. Now this is the second cycle. Let my eyes flow with tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people has been broken with a mighty stroke, with a very severe blow. For I go out to the field, and behold, those slain with a sword. And if I enter the city, then behold, those sick from famine. Yes, both prophet and priest go about in the land they do not know. Have you utterly rejected Judah? Has your soul loathed Zion? Why have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, but there was no good. And for the time of healing, and there was no trouble. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers. For we have sinned against you. Do not abhor us for your name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember, do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the idols of nations that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Are you not he, Lord our God? 
Therefore, we will wait for you, since you have made all this. Chapter 15, this is God's rent. Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward these people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth, and it shall be if they say to you, Where should we go? Then you shall tell them. Thus says the Lord, such as for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. And I will appoint over them four forms of destruction, says the Lord, the sword to slay, the dogs to drag, the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth to devour, and destroy, and I will hand them over to trouble to all the kingdoms of the earth, because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. For who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Or who will bemoan you? Or who will turn aside to ask, how are you doing? For you have forsaken me, says the Lord. You have gone backward. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am weary of relenting, and I will winnow, winnow them with a winnowing fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people, since they do not return from their ways. Their widows will be increased to me more than the sand of the seas. I will bring against them against the mothers the young man and the plunder, plunderer at noonday, I will cause anguish and terror to fall on them suddenly. She languishes who has borne seven. She has breathed her last. Her son has gone down while it was yet day. She has been ashamed and confounded, and the remnant of them I will deliver to the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. Now comes to Jeremiah, Jeremiah's rant. Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and a man of contention, to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest, nor have men lent to me for interest. Every one of them curses me. The Lord says, surely it will be well with your remnant. Surely I will cause the enemy to intercede with you. In the time of adversity, in the time of affliction, can anyone break iron, the northern iron, the bronze, your wealth and your treasuries? treasures? I will give as a plunder without price, because of all your sin throughout your territories. I will make you cross over with your enemies into a land which you do not know. For a fire is kindled in my anger, which shall burn upon you. O oh Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your enduring patience, do not take me away. Know that for your sake I have suffered rebuke. Now let's read the rest of the chapter together, if you can. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because of your hand, for you have filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? Will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream as waters that fail? Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, then I will bring you back. You shall stand before me if you take out the precious from the vial. You shall be as my mouthpiece. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them. And I will make you to these, to these people a fortified bronze wall, and they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem you from the grip of the terrible. Amen. Amen. It's quite a 
emotional section of the scripture. And um, a lot of, I give most Bible commentators believe that this prophecy is written between the first and the second Babylonian invasion. Uh, some time ago, I gave you the charts with the, um, the years. First deportation took place 605 BC. Second deportation took place in 597 BC. So you see during those times, there was a terrible drought, droughts, plural. And then soon, Jeremiah describes about those uh, invasion, deportation, uh, and the dead bodies lying on the streets as well. So uh, that's why that it, it is dated there. Now, as I said, there are two cycles uh, of five subjects, starting with Judah's problem uh, with the drought, and then Jeremiah prays and God answers. Jeremiah intercedes again, and then God speaks and have final uh, speaking, final answer. So we look at the first round, first uh, round, chapter 14, first six verses. Judah's problem is a severe, severe droughts. People of Israel, as you know, lived in the place with a limestone. They dug into this uh, limestone a cistern to hold the waters, which is crucial for their survival. But uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a really difficult uh, to keep the water there. And then when you imagine severe bouts of droughts in plural, obviously uh, it's impacting them very, very deeply. Um, in Israel, you get either east easterly wind or westerly wind. If you get the westerly uh, wind from the sea that picks up the moisture, it's a cool wind that actually causes uh, rain to eventually come. Like Elijah was looking for that little cloud on the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, right? And uh, if you get the uh, easterly wind that is from the desert, very hot uh, desert, and uh, it just, uh, it's a scorching wind, it dries up. Uh, unfortunately, its uh, weather pattern seems to have really changed. They just get a westerly wind and not, um, uh, sorry, easterly wind and not a westerly uh, wind. And there's a severe drought. Uh, Jeremiah is describing young men uh, going out to, um, to get some water out of the system, uh, but uh, there is no water there. So he comes back empty handed and the elders are, you know, uh, are suffering. And the farmers who also cover their faces in shame because uh, they cannot plow the land that is hardened and cracked dry. It's also describing animals. Uh, so usually the pattern of judgment is it starts with the weather patterns and it gets closer, closer and closer to people uh, finally with the invasion. Okay, so the animals now um, also suffering. It's a vivid picture of a very, very uh, severe uh, drought. Um, the animals' eyes are failing. They're sniffing, uh, you know, for some kind of a moisture. And the very sturdy, hardy animal is um, wild donkeys. Even their eyes are failing and they die in the land. There are other animals that, uh, like deers, uh, they're giving up their cups, their little babies, because they, uh, of the lack of water. So it's a very, very sad situation. And when you look at the scripture, uh, Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26 talks about if people, God's people in the land, sin, sin multiply, they depart from the law of God, then the heaven will become brass. They will not get the rain. That's why Jeremiah again and again speaks to the people. Why don't you fear God who controls the sea, who controls the rain? And, uh, you know, he controls the blessing on your life. Why don't people learn to fear God and turn to all this Baal and other things? And in fact, that was the basis of Elijah's prayer, right? Because the people have departed from the Lord, Lord God and set up foreign gods. Jeremiah is saying, now at my word, I am executing as a prophet of God the laws that are written so that except by my word, you will have no rain. So that's what happened. What is God saying in all this? If you remember chapter 2 verse 13, it was a very significant word. God says to Judah, 
My people have forsaken the fountain of the living water. And they have replaced it with the broken cistern. They cannot give them water. So they can't have any more rain because they have forsaken the God of the rain. God who regulates the, uh, the weather pattern according to the law and the covenant, marriage covenant that they have made uh, with God in Sinai. So that's what happened. And now Jeremiah moves into prayer. And then you will find in this prayer, a particular form of prayer, two things. You will find it very effective, very powerful. You can find this form of prayer throughout the scriptures, especially prayed by the prophets of God, like Moses, uh, Samuel, Daniel. Two things here he starts out with is identification and confession of sins. Okay, so he's praying, O oh Lord, though our, let's say, our iniquities testify against us. Yeah, so he, again and again saying, we, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. But he says, do it for your name's sake. He's appealing for what? God's glory, God's, God's name. So this is the pattern of prayer that you will find. It's very effective, very powerful. I'm sure many of us have prayed this kind of prayer when we were praying a prayer of repentance for our nation, when we were praying for the drought to be broken. We all go back many years and thank God our dam is almost full. Praise the Lord. Uh, so this is how our prophets have prayed. Yet uh, Jeremiah is a bit mixed up in his feeling. In the middle of prayer, Jeremiah is saying, Why, God, have you treated us this way? I am puzzled at your action because you are the hope of Israel and you are the Savior in time of trouble for us. Why don't you help us? Why don't you help us? And Jeremiah is saying, God, you act like you are a stranger passing through the land. You act like you, you don't really care what's happening to your own people, your land. You are like a traveler who just passed through. You just sleep overnight and you move on. You don't care. You act like that, like other gods. What's happening? Why are you doing that to us? And unfortunately, that prayer didn't work. Still, there was no rain. Didn't work. It's a prayer of confession and a prayer, of, a prayer for help. SOS, God help. But God didn't respond to that prayer. And then he's praying, he's challenging God to live up to his name. For your name's sake, help us, forgive. But God did not respond. God is not answering their prayer. Heaven is still brass and there's still no westerly wind and not a drop of water, rain. And the, this is Jeremiah's problem. God actually did answer the prayer, but it's not the answer Jeremiah is looking for, was it? Sometimes the answer to prayer with no poses quite a problem to us. <laughs> it's a greater problem. But God did speak very clearly to Jeremiah. What is God's answer? Verse 10, and 10 to 12, it says, Jeremiah, God's response to Jeremiah's prayer. Jeremiah is praying, we, us, We've sinned our iniquity. What he's doing? He's lumping himself with the sinful nation of Judah. And then how does God respond? God doesn't bring himself up saying you with Judah and Jerusalem, but he's saying them, them, their sin, they. What is he saying? He's separating Jeremiah from Judah. It's almost like God is saying, don't talk to me about my people because they have become a stranger to me. These people are no longer my people. They have become strangers. They've gone after other gods. So God refused to say you. And uh, Jeremiah is saying we. God is saying they. Their sin. Because, why? Because these people's heart loves to wander away from me when things are good with them. That's what God says. God says, my decision is already firm. Because these people, as soon as the pressure lifts 
they wander away. So God says, do not pray for these people for their good. For their blessing. Stop praying for their blessing. What is the good? That is a drought being broken. They got, you know, bumper harvest. Everything returned to normal. And God is saying, don't pray for that. That situation to improve. Now, God didn't tell Jeremiah to stop praying for their repentance and return. But God says, stop praying like that. Why? Because they only run to me when they are in deep trouble. What does this repeated behavior prove about their heart? It's like God is saying almost, you know, well, almost everybody runs to God when disaster strikes. But when God comes to help, disaster leaves and then you get into good time, then it really reveals whether our heart runs after God. When God has blessed you, when God has blessed you and when there is no trouble, no enemy, and uh, you, know, you are dwelling in peace, then do you still go after God? God is saying, I've seen this cycle repeated over and over and over and over again. Yes, I am the hope of Israel, the rescuer out of trouble. Every single time I help them, immediately they go back to their sin. They leave me. And when you look at, uh, you know, especially Book of Judges, this cycle continues. And each time it goes deeper and deeper. This is the history of Israel in nutshell. And in some way also, history of the church as well. So when God blesses you, that reveals, you know, your heart and my heart. So God says this, I am fed up with these people only coming to me in the time of trouble. Only to get back into the vomit, into the trouble, into the sin, into the life, you know, um, uh, drifting away from me. I'm not listening to the, their prayers anymore because their heart is set. They, God says they love to stray from me. This is a hard thing to accept for Jeremiah. But God says, stop praying for them. It's too late. I've already made up my mind. I have given them over to the sword, to the famine and pestilence. In other words, the violence and the food shortage and then diseases. I don't know. When you look at some of the reports, it is quite interesting. I mean, it is quite scary. Uh, in, the way, in America, the land of the plenty, they begin to say, you know, expect food shortages to hit in the next few years. Um, and then diseases, I don't have to talk about that. Violence is filling the land. Three elements are the precursor, precursor of uh, a nation under God's displeasure, God's discipline, judgment. And these three elements, or two or three elements in combination in these short chapters, are mentioned seven times, seven times. God says, these will discipline them. These will separate the chaff from my real people. And God will go any length to get his own treasure out of, out of the earth. Amen? That's God's agenda. So, fourth, number four, uh, on the right hand. Jeremiah, what would you do when you get an answer from God like that? Would you stop? Jeremiah doesn't stop. He gives one more shot at it. <laughs> he doesn't give up so easily. So Jeremiah says in verse 13 to 15, Perhaps these people are not totally responsible for their being misled because there are so many prophets in the land so many pre preachers and pastors and teachers in the land, they prophesy and preachers only the good and the blessing. They are the prophets of blessing to promise only the bright future and God's blessing. And that they keep saying that God is pleased with them. So how can you punish them for being misled? That's all they're being taught. What is God saying? God says, I know. These prophets concoct messages I did not give them. They prophesy false visions. They will be the first ones to suffer sword, famine, and pestilence, along with the people who love to listen to their words. 
God describes the source of their ministry as four things. False vision, divination, that is a demonically inspired visions and dreams, worthless things, and deceit of their heart or self-deception. The mind is coiled to believe what they want to believe. They pick and choose from the word of God only the bits that taste sweet. And they teach them. Jeremiah talked about false prophets more than anybody else in the, in the Bible. But in the nutshell, God is saying, I want to excuse the people for believing false messages, false visions, because they want to believe false prophecies. But I'll see to it that these false prophets will be the first one to be punished. And also, the people go after, who go after these things will be punished also. So that's a tough talk. Poor Jeremiah is beaten down to the ground. And then God has a final word. And that wraps up the first round. God describes faith worse than the death of those who preach false falsity and those who love falsity. What is it? They will be robbed of the dignity of burial. Their body will be desecrated on the streets with no one to bury them. You know, the ultimate indignity is stripping of dignity in dying. God is saying their corpses will just rot on the streets of Jerusalem. This is not a children's book. I mean, this is not for children or, you know, um, very, very picture, I mean, you know, very, very difficult passages. So the first cycle of conversation has ended. Now the next cycle begins, but much deeper detail comes out of both from God's point of view and Jeremiah's point of view. And uh, I want to say that we are dealing with the historical facts. These are the histories are not some wild-eyed prophet in some strange time. All of these things that you are reading has actually happened in the Bible. And uh, all of these recorded words are the words of God and God's feelings. So this is a very challenging. I'm, my heart was very, very challenged as I'm reading through it. Uh, and we must learn history as those who do not learn from history are doomed to what? Repeat it. Unless we study the Word of God, book by book, every part of the Bible, we tend to get an unbalanced view of God. There was a man, uh, his name was Marcion. Uh, he lived in the second century. He began to teach that the God of the New Testament is God of love and God of the Old Testament is the God of justice. He began to separate the two more and more. And he began to encourage people to now just read the New Testament and don't read the Old Testament. That's a kind of an angry God. God in a bad mood. Or almost different kind of gods. And he began to cut out even the New Testament book of Revelation, which is harder than most of the Old Testament books. Uh, he began to cut that out and then he began to cut out even the uh, epistles, because God of the Old Testament pops up here and there. He even began to cut out the uh, uh, Gospels, because the same God of the Old Testament appears in the Gospels. Jesus began to teach this same God. So he began to you know, teach people to read the Bible with a pair of scissors. Uh, that's very dangerous. And we don't have to cut that out, but if we we'll only read, receive certain parts as the Word of God, other parts as irrelevant and don't really see the fullness of God, then we are bound to get a wrong view of God. It will not teach our hearts to fear God as we ought. Of course, there are different emphasis in the Old Testament and New Testament, is there? Old Testament tend to emphasize justice of God. New Testament tend to emphasize the grace of God, but that's two sides of the same coin. In fact, Bible is written this way so that we learn the justice of God first. 
Because unless you understand the justice of God and the judgment of God, how can you understand grace and the mercy of God? It will not make sense. So that's why I believe it is very important that we read and study every part of the Bible, which I believe Jeremiah is one of the most neglected part. And I believe not because it's more important than other parts, it is now more relevant because it is so neglected. This, this side of God has been neglected. We, hold, we need to hold on to both sides of the revelation to actually fear God and to love God at the same time and to learn to love God in an acceptable way. Even New Testament says, learn to serve God in acceptable way with reverence and fear because God is God of consuming fire. God hasn't changed. Um, God's nature hasn't changed. But thank God for the cross. We can come before God through the cross of our Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, cycle two begins. Now, I say the left hand. So we can count one, two, three, four, five. Now, Judah's pro problem has grown bigger. Uh, it's become more severe. Um, now, the sword and famine and captivity. They've experienced sword. They have experienced famine. And then God is promising captivity is coming very soon. Uh, captivity has been experienced partially. In the first time of invasion, uh, Babylon didn't carry out carry away everybody but the, just the cream, top of the cream of the society. They know what it's like, but the more is coming. So that's why um, uh, many scholars date this book possibly between the first and the second Babylonian invasion. God tells Jeremiah to take up a lament for Judah instead of prayer for them. L mourn for them, lament for them, because problem will deepen from the drought to violence, from the violence to famine and disease, and fa f uh, from famine and disease to full-blown invasion, and eventually exile in a foreign land. Israel's enemies began to attack the weakened state of Judah already, even Egypt and different you know, uh, surrounding nations coming and picking off uh, the weakened uh, state of Judah. So Jeremiah is praying. Now he came back to God much deeper and uh, with a much stronger sympathy for Judah now. And uh, this is his words, uh, verse 19 to 22. He says, have you God utterly rejected Judah? Has your soul loathed Zion? Doesn't call, what is Zion? It's uh, Jerusalem with a, you know, more glorious, you know, Zion uh, language of God's ownership. Have you stricken us so that there is no healing for us? You know, before, some months ago, Jeremiah prayed, God, I don't understand you. You behave like a stranger as a passerby. But now, I really don't understand you because you are not just a stranger to us. You are a smiter. You are the one who smite us. You strike us with your road. Why? The terrorists have come. Violence has begun to show. Now the bodies are lying on the streets in Jerusalem. Jeremiah repeats the earlier prayer of identification, confession of sins again, and now he digs his feet on the ground. He goes even further. Verse 20 and 21 and the following. And he says, and he says this very interesting word. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. Where is the throne of God's glory? Jerusalem. It's the temple. Throne of your glory. This is the throne of your glory. Does that sound familiar? The way Moses prayed? You know, your glory, your name. For the sake of your glory, your name. Remember, do not break your covenant with us. He's saying, how about your name, your reputation, your glory? Jeremiah appeals to God that he already knows that dumb idols of Israel cannot send rain. So he doesn't expect these idols. God, he's saying that you are the creator. You are the faithful God, faithful to your covenant. 
Please send the showers of rain. And Jeremiah's touching prayer ends with this. What a tremendous prayer, like David is. Therefore, God, I know you are the God of Israel. You are the creator God. I know these dumb idols, we don't expect it, but you are the covenant-keeping God, he says. Verse 22, the very last word, you can read with me. Therefore, we will wait for you. He says, we. Are you not he, O Lord our God? Therefore, we will wait for you, since you have made all this. In other words, look at the structure of Jeremiah's appeal. He appeals to God as a tender physician. Heal us, God. You are the physician. You are the healer. He is appealing to God's forgiving nature. We have sinned against you, God. You are forgiving God. And he is, again, talking about God's honor and God's name. Do not disgrace the throne of your glory. You put your name in this, in this city and then God, he appeals to God as omnipotent creator and he says i will he doesn't say i will we will wait for you no matter how long you alone can send the rain would your heart be moved when you hear a prayer like that very effective prayer but what god, what's, what what does god say was god's heart moved his heart was moved but the answer is still the same and god has now a rent much longer reply then the first one, God really shows up his emotion here. It hangs out. God is wearing his emotion, his heart, in his sleeve. And I believe this is a very rich part. Most people just want to skimp over it, can't take it, don't want to look at it. But I challenge you to get into it with prayers. It's nine verses. I want to call I call it holy rent, if I can call it reverentially. Uh, reverently to God. And uh, God says, number one, he says, God says, cast them out of my sight. Can you feel God's anger? Cast them out. Jeremiah says, where? God says, to death, to sword, to famine, and captivity. And God has appointed four forms of destruction, sword to slay, dogs to drag, birds to devour, and then final stage will be exile in captivity. Get them out of my sight. Then God says, extraordinary phrase. God says, I am weary of relenting. I am weary. I'm tired. I'm tired of always giving you another chance. That's the Living Bible translation. God is slow to anger, but it doesn't mean it's never. There comes a point where even God gets tired of relenting or holding back justice, judgment for the wicked. And um, I've talked about this many times. You watch this decade. The theology and the churches that will begin to teach universalism that says that God will always lead us heavenward because he's God of love. And someday, even after death, we will all somehow in some way end up in heaven because God is God of love. God doesn't know how to get angry. God doesn't know how to punish death because love overpowers justice. To them, hell is kind of a purgatory. It's kind of a corrective detention center to teach bad soul to repent so that God can eventually drag their soul to heaven. This is not what Jesus preached. This is not the Bible. This is a hard truth. But this is the God of the Bible. God of the Bible and God of Jesus. God says, something very surprising and humbling to Jeremiah. Can I get a glass of water? Somebody? Yeah. Very humbling, surprising. And God says this, if, even if Moses or Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward these people. Cast them out. Let them go. Let them go. 
Jeremiah, let him go. Both of whom Moses and Samuel were considered as the thank you, Colette, beautiful Colette, thank you. God, these two prophets were considered most revered, greatest prophets in the Old Testament. They were over the whole house of Israel, these two. Elijah was really just for really over, looking over for the northern part and so on. And different uh, prophets had portfolios. But the Moses and Samuel were over the whole house of Israel, um, uh, God's people at the time. And both of them interceded for God's people and they changed God's mind. With exactly the same prayers, you will see the same kind of a four elements that uh, Jeremiah prayed. He learned it from who? Moses and Samuel. <laughs> Daniel learned from them, and he does the same thing later on. And we learn from all of them. We pray this way. Effective. But God says, even if Moses and Samuel stands before me, this deal is not going to change. Moses prayed and changed God's mind four times. Samuel changed God's heart twice from destroying Israel. And God says, you know what? It's too late. It's already done. Even if these two, who are greater than you, uh, pray, it won't be done. It's already done. It's sealed. Why wouldn't God relent? Well, let me give you two reasons. The first one is that Jeremiah didn't get the nation's cooperation on his side as Moses and Samuel did. Uh, they were both speaking over the whole Israel and they were wailing even though it was very surface. Um, Jeremiah's voice was a lone voice largely going ignored. People's heart did not turn much at all. But there is even deeper reason, real reason. God says here, God says why. He says, because there was an actual date that God's decision was sealed. When was it? It was during the time of Manasseh, son of Hezekiah. He killed and offered babies to demon gods. And it was around the time when Jeremiah was just born or just about to be born. About the same year, I don't know whether he was just breathing or not. But it was well before the time Jeremiah was called into ministry to speak for God to Judah. Can you imagine the shock, how Jeremiah would feel when he found out now, after years of ministering and being hated, for his ministry, for the words that he was speaking, that, that the fate of the city was already been sealed before God called Jeremiah to preach for him. <laughs> Can you feel this heartache, this anger? It's, why, God, did you call me at all? Why? Even before Jeremiah was called, God has already settled it. And Jeremiah went through all the pain for what? Why then preach at all? Why? It's because God has shut the door for the nation to be redeemed as a whole, but not to the individuals. God promises Jeremiah that God would protect and deliver him personally, but not the whole nation, because Manasseh introduced astrology, spiritualism or spiritism human sacrifice and he shed countless innocent blood on the streets of streets of jerusalem and the bible says uh, manasseh seduced israel to sin more than all the nations which god drive drove them out before them can you imagine how god feels now god says you've gone backward you know, the nation, this land has been more defiled now that you are in than when you first came in. The nations that were before you defiled the nation, so I brought you in, cast them out. Now you have made it worse, so I have to now cast you out of the land. So 
the nation of Israel as it stands is finished. God will restart later on with the remnants, not from the land of Israel, but from out, further out from where he called Abraham. From Chaldee, he will start again with few survivors. You know, the gospel actually requires the same individual response. It's the same gospel we preach. We never, gospel never offers household, I mean the nation whole salvation, group salvation. It must be individual heart that must believe, repent, believe and turn to God. So it's the same gospel, same salvation. Jeremiah's preaching for the individuals. Now the picture ends with a woman, that's a Jerusalem, very terrible uh, picture, who bore seven sons, mighty. She suddenly collapses in shock and breathes her last. In the, in the noontime, and then poetically, sun has gone down while it is still day, still the day. It's because the room has become dark. And the children that are people of Jerusalem are delivered to the sword. Can I get 10 more minutes? Yeah, finish this. And then now we come to Jeremiah's rant. He has a pretty long rant, a long rant. Jeremiah gets into his rant just as God got into his rant. Nine verses each, and God, Jeremiah even quotes God there. Jeremiah is embittered. His heart is bleeding all over the place. How would you feel if you found out that the fate of the city is decided before you were called and you suffer so much for what? <laughs> you were... <laughs> he said, God, aren't you cruel to call me to the lost battle only to wound me even more? And Jeremiah laments for himself now. Jeremiah laments for himself. And uh, this is what he says, verse 10, chapter 15, verse 10. Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. He says, everybody hates me. I'm not a moneylender, yet everybody hates me like a plague. Everybody runs away from plague, like a plague. I sit alone and I eat alone. He must have felt quite alone. Like Elijah felt like that, I'm the only one who is left. And Jeremiah is in deep pain and he wishes that he were never born. Was Jeremiah in depression? I think so. I think he was quite depressed. I mean, what takes it for a man of God to curse the day of his birth? He wishes he were never born. He doesn't want to get up in the morning. He doesn't want to face the day. He doesn't want to see the sunlight. He wishes he could just crunch in and then go back to the womb. Or before, he doesn't want to be in existence because it's too painful to feel and to think and to be alive because he feels so utterly shut out from people and he feels alone. He's even wondering if God's presence will fail him. He's like, Lord, where are you? I feel alone. I feel lonely. Will you be like a brook that fails when I need you the most? Where are you? What's the matter? That's Jeremiah's last prayer. He's a lonely man. He feels deserted by the people and by God. But in this prayer, sudden glimmer of hope breaks at this point. Unusually, God's response, and Jeremiah quotes him somewhere along the line, he says, you know, God says, surely it will be well with your remnant. God is trying to encourage Jeremiah. Notice the word, your remnant. God refused to say your people, you, you uh, and here is Jeremiah. But God begins to say you, meaning Jeremiah and the city together. In next few verses, surely I will cause the enemy to intercede with you in the time of adversity, in the time of affliction. I'll carry away your wealth, your sins, your territories, and I'll make you cross over with your enemies into a land which you do not know. Verse 11 to 14. I mean, God still speaks judgment, but God can actually bring him himself to say, 
your sins and once, just once, God says, my people. <laughs> so that prayer had effect on him. Now, he really want to have an effect on God. <laughs> yeah, no, don't curse the day of your birth. That's not the answer. <laughs> Now, but God says, God gives personal promise to Jeremiah for Jeremiah's protection, see, because Jeremiah is precious. And Jeremiah, God says, I'm going to protect you. Why? Because Jeremiah's foes are who? Really, his own relatives, his own people. Twice he comes through here as well. So God will not fail Jeremiah, when he needs him the most, Jeremiah, I will not fail you. I will not fail you. I will rescue you from your own family members, from all those who seek your life. It's an and then God says assurance. Gives Jeremiah assurance that although this unrepentant generation will perish, God's promise will continue on through the remnant, and God calls Jeremiah your remnant. And here we find Jeremiah's joy and pain. Now we come very deeply into Jeremiah's personal life. It is mini autobiography of Jeremiah. It's beautiful poetic language. I've you know read and reread these portions. Jeremiah says, Your words were found, and I ate them. Your word was to me joy and rejoicing in my heart. Verse 16. Let me ask you a question. I mean, I mean, even maybe even show of hands. Do you find God's word a joy? Do you find study of Jeremiah even joy in some painful, even though challenging and painful it is, yeah? In some perverted way. In some masochistic way, <laughs> do you still find joy? Because it is true word of God. You will learn about the heart of God, who God is. And you find truth, it washes you, it teaches you fear of God. It teaches you to tremble before God. It teaches you the heart of God. God is sharing the deepest part of his emotion through Jeremiah and with us. You know, that's... I find it very disturbing, uh, Jeremiah, yet I find it delightful in a strange way. Um, and I believe, how many know that uh, Book of Revelation, Apostle John had to go through the same thing, right? He had to eat the scroll, the Word of God, and the Word of God was sweet to his mouth, but bitter in his stomach. So is Ezekiel, so that they can prophesy again. I believe it is very important for the people, the church in the last days, to eat the prophetic word, even the bitter parts, and it will become bitter. I find it bitter in, the, in my stomach as I digest it, but it, it will give you prophetic perspective of the end time. It will really give you insight into the future. You will actually lose fear of the future if you can see and feel what God feels. If you fear what really needs to be feared, who really needs to be feared? And then you will not fear any other things. People who just go straight into the book of Revelation, you know, thirsting for some jigsaw puzzle knowledge, get overwhelmed with just fear of the things that are to come. But if you re really connect with the heart of God and fear God, these fears will disappear. Can I hear you say amen? Yeah. Now, unlike Jeremiah's peers, they're used to mingling in groups and rowdy parties. Jeremiah found himself from youth. He had to learn to sit and eat alone because Jeremiah was, was filled with holy indignation. It's God's emotion. The jokes that people laugh at, you, he couldn't laugh. All these talks that other people just crack up and get, you know, feel warm about, Jeremiah couldn't. Because the Word of God changed his joys. Because the hand of God has come upon him. Let me ask you a second question. Is, does it describe your life to a certain degree? Yeah, 
Christians, when you really get born again, you really want to pursue God, you actually get separated. You can't laugh at the things other people are laughing at. The people are going after it changes. The joy changes. Your circle of friends changes. There is an aspect of prophetic mental that brings about separation from the crowd and the years of preparation because you find joy in the things of God and your joy comes from internal not so much from external that the rest of the world looks after, goes after there is a greater degree of God's claim on his people, on his messengers people who love to eat the word of God as you deeply delve into the delight in God's truth and God's presence your joys have become suddenly so different you suddenly find out that you have become so different from the rest of your crowd effectively you have been separated out from the parting crowd around you it's no longer a joy and sometimes I'm sure you all wonder sometimes you wonder what's wrong with me or why am I so different from others sometimes God's people God's messengers God's sons and daughters who deeply love God can feel alone and lonely misunderstood that could be part of the prophetic burden that is on your life because the jealousy of God is on you you cannot mingle so freely with the rest of the world even though we live among them we reach out for them it means God wants you to learn to stand apart from the crowd and to and learn to stand with God and his priorities and his emotions Jeremiah fights in this in this dark time you know God you are not an unreliable stream if you've been crying out like that consider yourself being enlisted by God in his army in the prophetic mental is on you and sometimes you have to cry out to God God where are you why am I so different why am I alone and sometimes you don't enjoy it but it's because God has a claim on your life that cannot be shared with other people so easily all right, and God has a final word, and we read it together, and it ends up pretty much the same way we read before. And in fact, it's almost word for word, verbatim of Jeremiah's calling when he received his calling at the 17 years of age or thereabout. And God says, if you return to me, I will bring you back. You shall stand before me if you take out the precious from the vial, you shall be as my mouth. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them. Don't be driven by loneliness to be included. Stand with the Lord, stand with the word of God, stand with the truth. Be the light, affect the others, don't get affected by others. And you have got into this mess, you got into depression because you got onto the wicked people's side emotionally only got trapped in identification with wicked people people under God's judgment and not on God's side for God's justice God's feeling God's anguish God's pain and it is very difficult for us to enter in and identify with God's emotion we we think that God is just mighty and in heaven and he does what he wants we rather give sympathy to the people Right? That's quite natural for us to give sympathy, but God is teaching Jeremiah to learn that his sympathy, his emotion is actually wrapped up in the heart of God as well as he learned to intercede. In fact, did you know that this, this will be the place that the church will come into in the last days? I'll just read uh, Revelation 11. In the seventh trumpet, it's the same thing happens. See, what Jeremiah has experienced is what the church will be experiencing worldwide. Worldwide. Now turn to our seventh trumpet. In uh, 
Revelation 11, sorry. Did I say 7? 11, yeah. Verse 17. Uh, verse 16. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. Let's read together. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants the prophets and the saints those who fear your name small and great and should destroy those who destroy the earth did you notice that the nations are angry and raged at god because god has started to reign in justice and he's began to judge the nations as he's coming back and the time for the saints and the prophets for reward has come so um, I believe this is a, not an easy lesson but I believe it will become more apparent as uh, the generation that goes deeper into the very last days as God's plan unfolds as Jesus comes back that we will see a certain aspect of judgment of God coming upon the nations of the world and many who do not know connect with God strongly simply easily sympathize only with people and really miss the heart of God and what God is after God wants to bring his kingdom back on earth and destroy the wicked all that taints destroy the earth uh, for the sake of love for the sake of love but this is a still a more lesson that Jeremiah has. Isn't God uh, tremendously patient that God goes through exactly the same thing twice with Jeremiah? Again and again, same cycle. And we'll probably go through the same cycle. And, uh, you know, God repeats Jeremiah's initial calling again here. And God assures Jeremiah that he is never failing book. He says, I am with you. To save you and to deliver you says the Lord verse 20 let's say it together I am with you to save you and to deliver you says the Lord with this Jeremiah encouragement Jeremiah got onto his feet I don't know how many days or months it took but he did get onto his feet and the two became majority in the battle that lie ahead and I say that church as well you and me as we uh, move forward into the end time see the Lord is with us if we return to God if we learn to separate what is vile from the precious then we will be the voice of God in the last days and God's protection will not lift from his bride his faithful messengers amen amen let's pray